Um, I, I can give you one answer to this. Uh, one of the things I've been doing is studying death. In fact, what is the process of death? How do we die? And so we've got two things here. We've got the near-death experience with uh, the going down the tunnel being of light, the special area that you go into. And so that, that and only in cardiac arrest, only do it in cardiac arrest. So that tells us then that there is something very special going on for whatever reasons during the time the heart stops. So we need to look for other outliers when consciousness is in some way disintegrating. And in fact, the time to do this is to look at death itself. And if you look at death itself, one of the things you find as you come closer and closer and closer towards death, a whole lot of the phenomena that you see in the near-death experience start occurring to the people who are dying. For example, they see dead relatives who come into the room. Um, as they go on to the next stage, they exist in two realities. They exist in the reality which is uh, full of light and love and spiritual beings and dead relatives. Then they're back in the hospice. Then they go back to the other reality again. Then they're back in the hospice. And so as, as the whole consciousness fragments, what seems to come through uh, in the dying is this other reality. But, but Peter, if sort I, of cross validation. But if I can interject, I mean, the question was, can science yes, get a can. handle on this? I yeah, mean, it, can, can you go beyond the the subjective, however extraordinary, yes. the subjective stories? I mean, can can using the tools that we have at the disposal of science right now, can can they verify this? Well, I'm sure that one of the things we could do is to start putting people who are dying in scanners so we can actually see what their brains are doing, but I'm not sure that this would pass many ethics committees. <laughs> <laughs> so Sam, you were saying that science can definitively test this. I think, it, yeah, I think the ladies asked a very interesting question, and I think that the, the point we have to remember is that at any given era, you know, scientists will set sort of boundaries for what knowledge that is known at that time. And things work within that boundaries, but always there are things that don't quite fit in there. And many times, most scientists will ignore that, They'll try to stick to the framework that they have because it's more comfortable. And they'll continue researching that area. And then sometimes you have to go and look beyond. So what we have right now is certain phenomena that are challenging our worldview, and we have to be able to explore them. So I think to be able to explore this, you know, the question essentially that you're, I think you're asking is, can we test somehow scientifically the idea that consciousness, and by consciousness, I want to be clear, what we're talking about is what the Greeks called the psyche or the soul. That thing that makes us who we are. It's just a scientific term for me, for the self. Can we test whether that can be separate from brain function? Right. And so I think one area to do this is looking at um, times where, whether we like it or not, the brain has to be shut down. One of those is when the heart stops and there's inadequate blood getting into the brain. So we could continue the sorts of studies we've started with the AWARE study. But another area which is perhaps more controlled is um, looking at certain groups of patients who have to go for surgery where their only option is to have their body cool down to such an extent, they see to 18 degrees Celsius, which is around 60 degrees Fahrenheit, that their brain also flatlines. The brain cannot function. There's no circulation at all. And to study whether consciousness continues or stops. So if, obviously, if when the brain doesn't function, consciousness also completely stops, and there is no element of that, then that suggests that consciousness must be produced from the brain. If, on the other hand, you can get reports of people who can accurately have awareness, they can see things or hear things, and we can validate those claims, then clearly that suggests that consciousness may be functioning uh, independent of the brain, and that in that case, perhaps the brain is acting more as a mediator rather than the producer of consciousness. But how do you know uh, that... You can set targets for them. No, but... but many of the stories might be, uh, that, that people talk about, might be as they are coming out of this oh, no, unconscious no. state. And uh, may, I mean, maybe the, maybe the doctors assume that they were unconscious. That's a very good point. So you're basically saying is, you know, do we know if the experience is occurring when the brain's coming back online or right. just before they're flatlined? Well, actually, one of the things that we did find in our AWARE study is that this is the first documented case of somebody who we can verify that they had consciousness at least during a three to five minute period when the brain would not have been functioning rather than, so we've timed it, rather than when the brain was coming back online. But you can do that because you can give 
patients, say, who are having surgery and whose brain has shut down, certain stimuli at certain times. And then if they can recall them, you know that it was occurring when the brain had flatlined. You also can give them stimuli when the brain has come, come back online. So you can distinguish when the consciousness or activity of the mind or psyche or soul or whatever term you want to use it is going on. Okay. I, before we go to the, the next question, Kevin, do you want to respond? Yeah, let's take a little different tack. First thing which you cannot do is reproduce much of the context of near-death experience. That is the fear of dying. And, and that takes away a great deal. But that doesn't mean we cannot have um, human models for near-death experience. In fact, we already do. In 1994, a neurologist um, in Germany by the name of Lempert um, had 42 people um, experience syncope. They were young college students. And he recorded their subjective experiences. And when he compared those to Raymond Moody's reports, there are, in fact, no differences. That includes the tunnel, seeing other beings, you know, having out-of-body experiences. So, in fact, we already have a model for near-death experience, but it's, you know, but it, again, we can't put it in the context of fear of your dying. And the context is important. You can't underestimate the context in which these experiences are.